hope you can hear me clearly and you can see my slides as yeah, well. We uh, no, I, I chose the title because uh, um, when I started teaching online, uh, I, I, I really thought that uh, I was given a lemon. And uh, my face was something like this that you can see on the screen. It was, uh, it was not something nice. It was not something uh, uh, pleasant. Uh, we were thrown into the uh, pool at the deep end and we had to learn how to swim at a very short notice. Uh, I was asked to talk about the Malaysian experience. I was asked about how teachers have been coping with the COVID-19 situation in Malaysia, how they have managed their, their classes and what kind of problems they faced, what kind of strategies they have used to uh, overcome the problems. I think all over the world, teachers have shared some very common problems. And I don't think that these problems would be very unique in the Malaysian context. But what I did, I contacted a few colleagues, a few friends, and I, and I tried to collect the most common responses that they have come up with as what difficulties, what problems they have met during the past few months, and what kind of strategies, what kind of uh, uh, coping strategies, and probably, well, actually coping strategies might be the wrong word because we don't hope to cope. We, we hope to strive in this new uh, situation that we found ourselves in. So what kind of strategies they use to, to overcome the difficulties and provide good quality education for their learners? So let's see first what kind of difficulties they have listed. And I'm absolutely sure that most of these difficulties will resonate with you because you have also success. So although government ministers of education are, are promoting online teaching, they are promoting the use of internet, not everybody has access to internet. I'm currently in the state of Sarawak um, on the island of Borneo. Uh, the state of Sarawak has about 200 schools that are without electricity and running water, let alone internet connection. Now, when those students go home to their own villages, when they, when they stay at home, they may not even have a mobile signal, not internet connectivity. So the gap between rural students and urban students has been growing exponentially in the past few months. And I think we are very responsible for doing something to stop this. Otherwise, it leads to enormous inequalities in society. Even when there is internet, the availability of technology, the availability of devices is a huge issue. Imagine when a family has one smartphone that they can use to access the internet, but there are three siblings at home, three children who have classes, who have homework to do, who have many other things that they would like to access, but they have to share the phone. Who has priority? Is it the older brother who is graduating from school or is it the, the youngest of the three who is just starting primary school? How do we manage these situations? This is not easy and, and parents have to face that. Let's suppose they have internet connection, Let's suppose they have enough devices, but how to use it? We teachers are sometimes struggling with the technology. We have to learn new tools, we have to use new platforms, but how about the kids? Who is going to teach them? We cannot use the same platforms to teach them how to use it. One of the, uh, the teachers uh, 
Glad James, she was saying that, you know, the kids don't know how to use Google Classroom. So although materials are there, although there is a, the teaching content, but children are sending the messages saying that, sorry, we can't access the materials there. Distractions. Learning from home is not easy. There's the television, there are the siblings, there's mom, there's dad, there's the fridge with snacks, there's the dog, there's the cat. Home is always home with lots of distractions. It's very difficult for, for kids to focus on their learning when all the uh, temptations are around there. And at the same token, for teachers, it's not very easy to, to work from home because we also are exposed to all these temptations and distractions. So this is something that, that we need to cope with on top of our teaching duties and students have to cope with their, their learning tasks at home. It's a new environment. It's, it's not something that they are used to doing. Connectivity and feedback. I think uh, uh, Shravan Kumar was talking about the problem of facing muted microphones and disconnected cameras in teaching. But students have problems, they rarely ask questions. I'm teaching two courses at the university right now. And one of the most difficult tasks for me was to, to learn how to talk to myself, because basically this is what I'm doing, just like now. I'm, I'm seeing myself on the screen, I'm talking to myself, and I have absolutely no idea how you are receiving what you are saying. You know, in the old world, when there was a conference and I could stand in front of an audience, my eyes were scanning the, the people's faces to see reactions, to see if I have to repeat myself, to see if there's something that I would probably explain in a different way. But now I don't have that kind of feedback. So it's, it's a problem for both teachers and for learners. We don't have the human touch. We don't have the human connectivity between us. So the question is, what to do? And I was thinking about this question quite hard in, in the past few months. Um, I was thinking about strategies. I was thinking about tools. But the problem with strategies and tools is that they are not always applicable. A strategy might be working in one particular context, but not in the other one. Same about tools. You know, some people, it would be love to use Metrometer, but if my internet connection is not strong enough, I cannot do that. So instead of focusing on strategies and instead of focusing on, on tools, what to do, I was asking my, my colleagues who are teaching in Malaysia, but what they do and how they manage their everyday work. And listening to them, I noticed three common strengths, three common features that all of them have. The first one is adaptation. Most successful teachers in the COVID-19 area are able to adapt to a new situation. They are able to change. You know, when we talk about the, the evolution of, uh, of the species, um, we don't talk about the survival of the fittest. We talk about the survival of the most adaptable, who can change according to the needs of the environment. So adaptation is a skill that is a must for teachers in the post-COVID and in the COVID area. The other thing that was very common among these, these teachers that I talked to is the ability to learn new things. They were open to learn new skills. They were open to practice new ideas and take risks because learning is a risk-taking process. They had to admit that as teachers, they have to be lifelong learners. They cannot simply sit back and do 
whatever they have been doing in before the pandemic started. And finally, what I found very important is dedication. Most of the teachers who have been successful educators during the pandemic were dedicated to give good education for their learners. They were dedicated to the profession. They were dedicated to the development of their communities. So these three things, adaptation, learning, and dedication, made them stand out from the rest. Adaptation, learning, and dedication helped them turn the lemons into lemonade. This helped them enjoy what they are doing now in this new context. So let's see a few examples of what they have been doing. In the first talk, we heard about creativity. One of my colleagues, Santaner, was saying that she was able to make creative videos for her lessons, which she did upload on YouTube. So the situation which deprived her from an active face-to-face -face classroom interaction with her students made her explore new avenues, made her to be a more creative person. Creativity only works within the framework of certain limitations. Limitations were given by the pandemic. She used whatever he had at her disposal and she created something new. So for successful teachers, creativity, practicing creativity, becoming a creative practitioner is one of the key things to survive and not just survive, to, to thrive in the pandemic classroom. Um, the next one, collaboration. More than ever, collaboration among teachers has been essential. Uh, one of my colleagues here in Sarawak, Jiai Ho, she was saying that she learned that the younger teachers can and should help the senior teachers. And suddenly, I think my shared screen is disappeared. So let me just, just try to go back again and share the screen with you. All right. And now I have to very quickly just go to the end where I have been. I'm sorry about, this is also the technical problems of, of doing teaching online, okay? So, so collaboration among colleagues is especially important uh, during these days. And not just with colleagues, uh, another teacher, Forster Ruben Leo, says that he valued the involvement of the parents in their children's learning. So whereas before the pandemic area, teachers were doing their own job in the classroom and parents were probably helping their children at home. Now what we had is a more active collaboration between parents and teachers. So Forster uh, was in everyday contact with the parents, sometimes helping the parents explain concepts to their children. So his students' parents became his co-teachers in the process. And isn't that beautiful? The whole concept of uh, raising a child is the task of the whole village was actually manifested in, in Forster's teaching experience. Quick, quick check, a time reminder, five minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, another area is professional development. Uh, Abdullah Navi, uh, a colleague from a Johor University said that the pandemic gave him the opportunity to, to familiarize himself with virtual meetings, video conferencing platforms, things that he didn't have time before, but out of necessity, he had to uh, live up to the challenges and learn 
these new tools. And in the same line, uh, again, Jiang Ho said that there's a plethora of Hello. online conferences, webinars, and other uh, sources which are available to teachers. Like now, I'm very happy and proud to present at the Nelt of Thinking uh, right now without leaving my, my study at home. And this is what we can do uh, in this era. One more thing is empowering learners. If you are trying to teach in the old traditional teacher-fronted way during the pandemic, you will not succeed. What you need to do is give your learners the opportunity to be the managers of their own learning. You have to give autonomy for your students and you have to trust them that they can live with that autonomy. They can be responsible for learners if you trust them and if you give them the opportunity. The problems, however, starts in the most rural areas, like in, in the heart of Sarawak. Uh, many small villages have no electricity, no internet. So what do teachers do in these particular situations? In this picture, you can see a young teacher, Mohamed Nazmi, who delivered homework worksheets to these remote villages, spending about two, three hours on the road every day at the back of a pickup truck, rain or shine, to meet his students, because these villages are completely locked away from the outside world. The people in the villages did not want strangers to enter the village because they were afraid that they might bring in the virus. But Nazmi went to these places, he collaborated with the community, with the elders, and he was allowed to, to proceed and deliver his work. He was saying that platforms. And I think this is the key message. You can do a lot more without, well not a lot more, but you can do still a lot without having the online facilities or most up-to-date tools. What you need to do, you can see Nazmi with his students in this picture, what you can do is express yourself be yourself, explore new ideas, don't be afraid of taking risks, and then as a learner and a teacher, you will do great things. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.